Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, where we discuss infamous cases of death and murder that have an element of food to them, and then I cook or sometimes sample the food from the case. I'm trying to be a little bit better about the marketing aspect of my life here on YouTube, so if you would, please subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and you can also join my Patreon if you would like to support me. It means the world to me and is helping more than you know. I'm Stacy Lee. Let's begin. Syphilis. There, I said it. That's out of the way. You know, I don't know what it is with these gangsters, but man, they had a lot of syphilis. The most famous, of course, is Al Capone, who is believed to have contracted syphilis as a teenager from a prostitute working on the docks in Brooklyn. But today, we are talking about a much lesser known mobster whose syphilis became such an issue for his bosses that it led to his very infamous murder at Joe's Elbow Room, a New Jersey diner. Willie Moretti, born William Charles Moretti, was an American Mafia member associated with the Genovese crime family. He was born on February 24, 1894, in southern Italy and then immigrated to the U.S. with his family when he was very young. He was raised in the city's Little Italy neighborhood of New York. He first got arrested for robbery in 1913 when he was only 19 years old, and he was sentenced to prison for a year. He ended up doing only a few months at that time. Willie was basically born into the Mafia. He was a cousin of Frank Costello, who is of course the very famous boss of the Luciano family. Willie, however, became associated with the Genovese family, and I found that unusual. Before I really started studying the Mafia and I knew much about the Mafia, I always thought that it was like, you know, if you were in this family, that was hardcore this family, or this family, hardcore this family. And what I've learned is that sometimes they wanted members of their own families integrated with other families, almost in a spy situation, where the person really kind of was associated with that family, but they were always going back and forth between and sharing information. So, you know, the mafia, you can look at them two ways. You can either say they're just a bunch of dumb thugs, or you can be correct and say they're far from that. Very organized, um, very good at what they did, very manipulative, and very good at business for the most part. Willie Moretti was known for his involvement in racketeering, gambling, and loan sharking. From the 1930s to the early 1950s, Willie Moretti ran gambling dens in New Jersey and upstate New York. He became an important figure in the Genovese crime family, serving as a captain within the organization, sometimes called the underboss. Even though they were in different families, different mafia families, Moretti and his cousin, mob boss Frank Costello, who is considered one of the most powerful men in the American mafia ever, they stayed close. Other bosses saw their family tie as a good thing, kind of a bridge between the two families, like I said earlier. Moretti's rise to power within the Genovese crime family came at a time when the American Mafia was experiencing significant growth and expansion. During the 1930s, Moretti was involved in several high-profile criminal operations, including, apparently, the kidnapping of millionaire Charles Lindbergh's infant son. That's a story I'm going to leave for a different day because the Lindbergh kidnapping is something that changed American culture forever, and I want to really do a deep dive on that story. But Willie kind of had his fingers in everything, and his gambling operations brought in millions and millions of dollars for the mafia under his control. Willie Moretti was a very well-liked guy. He wasn't the psychopathic killers we talk about in the Mafia like Albert Anastasia or Roy DeMeo. He was a happy-go-lucky guy. He was talkative. And although, yes, he was feared because he was connected and he did do some violent things, he wasn't Messina DeNaro. He did, however, know how to take care of business. Willie Moretti was Frank Sinatra's godfather. He was close with the Sinatras and he kept a close watch out for Frank. When Frank Sinatra was young, he had become really well known singing with Tommy Dorsey's band. And Frank felt like he was really the star of the show and he wanted to branch out on his own. So Frank Sinatra went to Tommy Dorsey and asked for his own recording contract at Tommy's label. Well, Tommy said no. He didn't want Frank going out on his own. He knew how talented Frank was and he wanted to keep him in his own band. So the story goes that Willie Moretti, Frank Sinatra's godfather, cornered Tommy Dorsey one night and shoved a gun in his mouth. 
Willie supposedly told Tommy Dorsey that if he didn't let Frank out of his contract and let him go out on his own, he was going to pull that trigger. The details on this are somewhat up in the air, but many people say the story is part of the inspiration for the film of all mafia films, The Godfather. Willie Moretti was living the good life. He was rich, he was respected, and he had friends in high places. He was friends with Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, and he spent a lot of time with the men at the Riviera Club in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Willie even had Milton Berle perform at his own daughter's wedding. He was famous, he was infamous, and he was enjoying it all. I love these old stories. Not only is the Mafia itself fascinating, but the characters in the Mafia were like rock stars during the day. It's kind of hard to really think about that because they were criminals, but they're fascinating not only because they're criminals, but because they were so famous and they hung out with very famous and interesting people. Willie Moretti's criminal activities did eventually catch up with him. In 1951, he became the target of a federal investigation into organized crime. And this is where things kind of take a turn for Willie. Willie was subpoenaed to testify before Congress. If you're into mafia stories, you know that when gangsters are brought in to speak at these types of things, they are stoic, they are quiet, they are serious. They don't say much, if anything at all, and they are visibly angry about having to be there. They treat it as an insult and an act of disrespect, and they want to make that clear with their demeanor. Well, that was not what Willie Moretti did. Willie not only didn't keep his mouth shut while testifying, which is expected of mob guys, he talked all throughout the proceedings. He laughed, he told jokes, and he treated the entire situation like a joke. He also did one thing that really, I don't know many gangsters have gotten away with besides maybe John Gotti. He mugged for the cameras. He posed for photos. He played up the attention and let me tell you, it did not go over well with his bosses and not just his bosses, but bosses from other families as well. A meeting was held to discuss this and people who were defending Willie said that he wasn't all there. Why? Syphilis. Now, I don't know the nuances of how the mobsters sat around and talked about their medical conditions, but I know that a lot of them talked about their syphilis because they all knew who had it. Ugh. It's very unsavory and sad because there was no treatment. I mean, now it's something that's very treatable, but back then, you know, it was a big deal. But a lot of these men that liked Willie knew that he had syphilis and it affects your mental condition. So they were kind of trying to defend him saying that the reason he acted the way he did when speaking in front of this very authoritarian board was because of his syphilis and he should be given some mercy, you know, given a little bit of rope for that. This plan kind of backfired because now not only were the bosses angry that Willie Moretti had acted the way he did, they were worried about the fact that his mental condition was not 100%. It was decided that something had to be done. People liked Willie, but the mafia does not take risks when it comes to allowing people to talk about their business. So as it was discussed, the gangsters justified what they were going to do by saying it was a mercy killing. They told themselves Willie wouldn't want to live like that, but they had decided, again, mostly as justification, that they were doing him a favor. Also, Willie did get indicted, and the mobsters thought, here's this poor guy, he's got an advanced case of syphilis, and now he's gonna get locked up. They just couldn't risk it. On October 4th, 1951, Willie Moretti pulled up at one of his favorite spots to eat, Joe's Elbow Room, a restaurant in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. He sat down in his regular booth and ordered his lunch. He had four associates with him at the time. Suddenly, shots began to ring out, and when it was over, Willie Moretti was dead at the table. He'd been shot multiple times in the face. No one in the diner saw anything, and no one would talk to the police. To this day, Willie's murder remains unsolved, and several theories have been put forward regarding who was responsible for his death. There are those that believe Frank Costello, Moretti's cousin and close associate, ordered the hit on him to consolidate his own power within the organization. Another theory suggests that rival crime families, such as the Luciano crime family, may have been responsible for killing Willie, possibly due to a feud or to remove a potential threat to their own power. Another theory is that the U.S. government, specifically the FBI, was responsible for Willie's murder. 
This theory posits that the FBI killed Moretti because of his connections to organized crime and his possible involvement in several high-profile criminal activities, including the Lindbergh kidnapping. But most believe that it was, in fact, due to Willie's behavior at the hearing and the fact that they couldn't count on him to stay quiet any longer. Willie Moretti's life and criminal activities have been the subject of numerous books, films, and television series. He remains a very iconic figure in the American Mafia. I did a lot of research on Joe's Elbow Room and there is just not a lot of information out there. As soon as I post this, somebody will come and bring all this information that I wish I had but that I couldn't find online. So please, if you know anything about Joe's Elbow Room, comment. There's just not a lot out there. I did learn that it was a very classic American diner. They served very classic 1950s diner food. So stay with me right now. We are going to make what I consider the mother of 1950s diner food, Salisbury steak, as we go dining with death. We are ready to cook. Let's make some Salisbury steak. Now, the first thing you need to know about Salisbury steak is that it's not steak. It's hamburger. Usually when it's served to you, it doesn't look like a hamburger patty because they intentionally patty the hamburger out to look more irregular and oval like a steak. But it is in fact just hamburger. As always, the full recipe will be on my website, diningwithdeath.com. All the recipes from every cooking segment we've ever done are on that site. This is one pound of ground beef. You need half of a white onion. Now I'm gonna show you a little chef's trick here. When I make meatloaf, when I make meatballs, when I make Salisbury steak, I grate the onion. I don't like big chunks of onion mixed in with the meat and grating the onion also helps to disperse the onion flavor more thoroughly throughout the meat. Let's add that grated onion to the ground beef. And then I'm gonna take about a third of a cup of breadcrumbs and add that as well. Now we're gonna mix and let that sit for a moment so the meat can soak up the onion and the onion can kind of soak up the breadcrumbs. You wanna mix this really well until it becomes almost kind of a paste. Once it becomes kind of pasty, you know it's gonna to hold together. To that, we are going to add some grated garlic. That was just one big fat clove. I'm gonna add two tablespoons of ketchup. This is a recipe from the 40s and the 50s. Everything had ketchup in it. Next, add two tablespoons of Dijon mustard. Sometimes I feel like people discount the importance of mustard, especially in meat dishes. The tanginess goes so well with anything savory. Worcestershire sauce, about a teaspoon, maybe a teaspoon and a half. One egg to bind it. And I'm gonna put in a little bit of this better than bouillon. You can just use a beef bouillon cube if you want, or beef powder if you want. I like this better than bouillon paste. It's a lot more expensive, but the flavor's a lot richer and you don't have to use as much. I'd say that's not quite a teaspoon. And again, we mix. Now, I said pasty before. You want it to sit long enough to get a little pasty. Now you want it really pasty. All right, let's patty these out into steaks. I'm gonna make four. So I'm gonna divide my mixture in half and divide each half in half, just with my fingers to kind of give me an idea so they turn out equally. They pat these thin, they, in the 50s, I don't know who I'm talking about, they, and they kind of shaped them into an oval, an irregular oval. And you know how hamburger shrinks up when you cook it? That's why you want these to be really thin, so it stays larger. There's our first steak. <laughs> There's two, aren't they gorgeous? We're gonna drizzle a little bit of olive oil in a heavy bottom skillet, and then we're gonna brown each one of our steaks for about two minutes on each side. We are not cooking them all the way through. Let these fry up in the pan, and then use your spatula to kind of reinforce the edges to make them nice and firm. It's very, very soft. As the steaks are browning, we're gonna start our gravy, and I'm gonna do a mushroom gravy just because I love mushrooms. If you wanna do just a brown gravy and leave the mushrooms out, you can, why would you? I've got about 16 button cap mushrooms here and I'm gonna slice those up to get ready to saute.
Remove your meat from that frying pan and then take your mushrooms and brown them up in the exact same pan. You wanna pick up all that delicious fond off the bottom of the pan. I'm gonna add two tablespoons of butter. You need a little more fat. And this is where you can salt them very lightly and pepper them. This dish has a lot of salt, so we do not want to add a lot. I'm really fighting the urge to season these mushrooms more. But you know, I try to keep these recipes as authentic as possible, and they probably just would have put a little salt and pepper on them. Remove your mushrooms from the pan and set those aside. And then to the same pan, add a pat of butter. We're making gravy, so you're gonna add two cups of good beef stock and get that reducing. I'm gonna add about a tablespoon of Dijon mustard and whisk that in really well. And then I'm also gonna add another like half teaspoon of this beef paste. I love that stuff, it's so rich in flavor. Whisk that in. Now you can add a little more black pepper here, I wouldn't salt it. And the recipe said two tablespoons of flour. I should have known better. You never add just flour. And as I suspected, it was lumpy, it did not turn out right, I ended up sifting a bunch of the lumps out, and then I did what I should have done in the first place, which is make a cornstarch slurry. A tablespoon of cornstarch, a little bit of water, whisk that together and add that in. I try to be authentic, but you know, sometimes you just gotta go with what works. And now the gravy's starting to thicken. Put your meat patties back in the pan, and I got a spoon and kind of covered them again in the gravy. Then add the mushrooms back on top. You're gonna cook those for three to five minutes until they're done. Okay, let's plate this up. I'm gonna put a little extra gravy on mine. And it definitely needs a little green onion razzle-dazzle. Salisbury steak. Definitely not the prettiest thing that I've ever made. Kind of just glorified meatloaf. But you know, when times are tough and you want a steak, you can make one out of hamburger. <laughs> let's give this a taste. Oh, it's very soft. That trick with pushing everything in with the spatula while they're cooking is really important to keep the shape and to keep them firm. Let's get some mushrooms. That's better than I thought. That's actually not bad. I wasn't expecting it to be quite so savory or have the depth of flavor that it does. An American classic, like many of them, they aren't the best looking dishes, but they taste good. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death. I appreciate you sticking around for the cooking segment. The food from Joe's Elbow Room, what a story. Hit the like button. If you liked the video, subscribe to my channel if you wanna see more from me, and of course you can join my Patreon. On Patreon, we have a big goal. We want to raise money to donate to police departments that have cold case DNA in storage that cannot be tested because there's no money to test it. By joining Patreon, you help support the channel and in the end, you can help us raise funds for that very worthy cause. I sure appreciate you spending a little bit of your day with me. It just means the world to me. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other. And I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.